The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hello, I'm Carl Seidel, host of The People's View. The People's View is a show sponsored by the Nashua Republican City Committee. Uh, the committee meets uh, every second Thursday at the Crown Plaza. And if you want to contact us, we have a website, nashuagop.org. And at the end of the uh, show, you'll see some contact phone numbers or email addresses that you may want to uh, send us your comments and uh, uh, recommendations. Thank you for listening in. Welcome to The People's View, a program dedicated to discussing local, state, and national issues and their effect on the American people. The People's View provides a platform for state representatives and national figures to present their viewpoint. Whether it's social, economic, or financial topics, you'll hear it on The People's View. Hello. Today we have Dr. David Muratake uh, from Ward 5 running uh, again for re-election. And David, you're on the uh, Science Committee. Yes, and Science, I Technology, guess, and Energy. Okay, Science, Technology, and Energy. And that energy is the thing that's subject to uh, lots of news in the paper just recently. Well, can you tell us about uh, what the state has to worry about? Well, uh, you know, definitely you know, Carl, that the cost of energy has been a great concern to mm -hmm. New Hampshire for a number of years. It's gotten worse and worse, and even on my watch, I'm a freshman state representative, even in the last two years, we've had the price of electric energy and heat you know, skyrocket here in New Hampshire. Uh, the reason for that is actually easy to understand, and I think a lot of people know what the problem is. Uh, and that problem is, is that much of our heat and much of our electric generation is based on the lowest cost fuel that we can find, which is natural gas, which comes mm -hmm. from fracking. Now, usually, uh, natural gas is very inexpensive. And in fact, as close as 400 miles away from where we are, uh, you know, natural gas is very cheap. It's selling at like $3. But by the time you get to New Hampshire, because of the restrictions in the uh, natural gas pipelines available from those other nearby states to New Hampshire uh, and to places like Massachusetts, where the, you know, the primary uh, natural gas ports are, uh, it turns out that we're up sometimes over $20. And That's quite a multiple, isn't it? It, it is. And you know, it's all very market-based. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been saying, well, we know what the problem is. So why don't we simply increase the capacity of natural gas pipelines? And that's a really good question, Carl. Um, and and uh, you would think that if, if you've got all the people using natural gas to heat their homes and to run the electric generators that are then sold at wholesale to providers like PSNH for transmission, you'd figure, wow, you know, we, there, there's such a huge market there that you would expect that the people who want to sell natural gas and want to sell more of it are going to be selling or, or trying to increase through market forces mm -hmm. the, uh, the capacity of the natural gas so that they can sell more of their commodity. But, but now we run into an interesting thing. Uh, free markets are not always what they're cracked up to be. <clears throat> and here's our part of the problem. The first part of the problem is we have a very heavily regulated uh, you know, uh, power economy. We've got companies like PSNH, which are regulated power, uh, public utilities that are responsible by law to make sure that electric rate consumers are provided with adequate power. So these guys then go ahead and buy electricity from a number of deregulated retail or rather wholesale electric generators. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of these guys use natural gas to generate their, their power. So what happens is that 
Since people want to continue to use electricity, usually at peak, uh, we're, you know, we're over a barrel, basically. We have to pay the price that these electric generators, many of whom use natural gas, are asking for their power at market rates. And you say, well, you know, gee, Dave, um, why don't we just go ahead and make sure that these rate, uh, you know, the electric generators, the wholesale generators that are consuming the natural gas to generate our electricity, mm -hmm. Why can't we get them to insist on uh, having more supply? That's where we get to the interesting thing. Uh, when you talk about market forces, there have been a number of companies who said, yeah, you know what, that, there's a good reason for that. Let, let's go ahead and see if we can go ahead and using market forces, invest in providing higher capacity natural gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. In order for that to happen, two things, you need two things. One, uh, you basically need to work on your rights of way so that you can actually go ahead and dig the paths to lay those natural gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. and, and there we have what we call the power of NIMBY, mm -hmm. not in my backyard. And for example, uh, I read in this uh, past Sunday's National Telegraph how, this, how the, the, there was a special election in Hudson Mm -hmm. in which it was nearly unanimous. It was, you know, everybody except for one who voted to block the, the construction of an, an expanded natural gas pipeline through the city of Hudson. Okay, so when you have community after community that goes ahead and says, not in my backyard, you're not going to go ahead and put the natural gas pipeline through my community or not, then what happens is that the companies that are wanting to invest in market-driven expansion of natural gas pipelines are gonna say, hmm, it's gonna cost us more and more money in mm -hmm. order to invest, in order to expand the natural gas pipeline. And this means that if, when, if and when we succeed, we're not gonna be able to take all those windfall profits mm -hmm. that come from being able to sell natural gas a little cheaper. At, yeah. you know, at, at, that, at that incredible price when yeah. it spikes. So, um, but the other thing that you need for market forces to work is that these companies that will invest to put in natural gas pipelines are looking for what we call subscriptions. You know, if I increase the capacity mm -hmm. overall across the state by, say, a billion cubic feet, who will sign up or subscribe to my expanded service? Right. And it turns out that the only guys that are signing up are the, are the, pu the regulated public utilities like PSNH. The retail gas, you know, gas powered electric generators are not signing up. Mm. And why are they not signing up? It's because a lot of us believe they're, they're essentially folding their arms and they're saying the Public Utilities Commission is basically going to require the regulated utilities like PSNH and Liberty, you know, to basically go ahead and tax the consumer to go ahead and mm -hmm. for the purpose of reliability, build the expanded natural gas pipeline. So why should I sign up and thereby invest mm -hmm. in the future when, you know, what we probably all want is we want to fold our arms and wait for the regulated public utilities to be directed by the, the State Public Utilities Commission to go ahead and expand those lines. Uh -huh. So well, you have the same problem with the hydroelectric power coming in from the north. You do. And so you have two. Is there any competition between the two? Or? Well, in, in a way, uh, there's maybe second order competition. Mm. Uh, but the thing is, it, you do have similar uh, problems, but perhaps more so. If you're talking about natural gas pipelines, those are all buried. Mm -hmm. And so it has very, very little viewscape uh, issues. In the North Country, however, the current, I call it the Northern Pass 1.0. Mm -hmm. This is the proposal that was in front of the legislature the past two years. Mm -hmm. And actually it's been going on for longer than that. The, the issue that the North Country residents have is that a lot of, people up in the North Country, uh, including property owners 
and not necessarily the abutters who are going to be right next to the lines. Uh, we're talking about you know, people who may have spent a lot of money to buy vacation property with the idea that they're not going to have to see uh, things like tall power lines or mm -hmm. wind farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, these individuals who see some simulations that are developed, sometimes by the developers and sometimes by anti-whatever uh, activists, uh, basically illustrate how ugly it's going to look or how not ugly it's going to look, depending on, on who does the simulation. Yeah. And so a lot of people in the North Country have been influenced by public opinion uh, and also by either lobbyists or activists to indicate... On both sides. On both sides. <laughs> and, you know, the, the problem at the state legislature that I've run into uh, is that we do not require testimony to the legislature to be sworn. So... Now you get all sorts of descriptions you of do. problems. You huh? get You get spun in this direction testimony. Yeah. You get spun in this direction testimony. And usually the truth is right in the middle. And sometimes both that side and that side essentially want some information to go into a deep, dark hole. <laughs> and we'll never, from either side, mention that kind of, of Well, of David, fact. we have a limited amount of time left, and I want to know what you think the solution is going to be. Well, that's, that's interesting. I, I believe, for example, that um, some form of state-mandated solution to the pipeline problem is going to have to be part of the solution. So it's going to be a mix of, you know, free market driven thing, which as far as our studies show, will maybe solve 25% of the problem, but that remaining 75% of the problem needs to be addressed by either enabling legislation that could make, uh, say, friendly uh, regula regulations made by the Public Utilities Commission. So you get a Public Utilities Commission report that the legislature says, all right, we'll take, use eminent domain to do this, and that's it. Is yeah, that, that what you're saying? Yes, there, it, that's part of the complicated answer. Okay. So I all think right. we're probably in for an interesting battle over the next two it, years. It sounds like we are, but in the meantime, we're getting, you know what, 50% increases. In yes, the um, right. Uh, you know, for example, the Public Utilities Commission, in the first uh, decision of a docket of a series of decisions like this, uh, Liberty Utilities was authorized to increase, I think it was what, 39 to 59 yeah, percent? Right. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, and we, another one's right behind them. I don't know yep. where PSNH stands, but uh, they're certainly going to have their. PSNH, I think, is going to um, have less change, and the reason for that is interesting as well. PSNH still owns generation capability. This generation capability is, is uh, not just natural gas. Uh, it's also got oil and coal. Mm -hmm. Oil and coal are less expensive than natural gas when it, when it peaks. So because PSNH actually owns these generation facilities, they're not stuck in using super expensive natural gas during the during well, the spikes. Is the nuclear reactor going to be uh, helpful in uh, providing some of this? Uh... You know, the nuclear reactor is probably going to be in service for another 20 years. Yeah. And it's probably one of the, uh, it, it's not the cheapest. It's, it's, it's more expensive than natural gas when natural gas is cheap. It's a lot less expensive than natural gas when natural gas peaks. And so it's, con it's going to continue to form a part of what we call the base load generation right, right. for electricity. In, but in the is there enough capacity for them to increase their output? Uh, no, okay. that's you know not without significant buildup. Um, the nuclear facilities essentially run at a good efficient rate, and the state basically goes ahead and, and uh, the PSNH guys, et cetera, will take what ISO New England says to take, and ISO New England essentially you know, will we'll, yeah. we'll dictate and, and purchase power from the uh, nuclear reactor at its probably its most efficient rate. So, so well, it's going to be an interesting time, and you want to get up there and be part of it. <laughs> I, I think so. I think I've actually begun to understand the complexity okay. of the issue, and I've got some ideas on, on how to move forward with this. Well, maybe get some of them working against, but some, you know, you can't have people uh, say no, not in my backyard, and still want cheaper power.
Right. It was yeah. it was interesting that the same guys, for example, in communities like Hudson, yeah. that are complaining bitterly about the huge, you know, spike in, in, in prices, both last season and what's been approved for them in the coming season, are also going in with ne nearly unanimous votes to block the expansion of the natural gas pipelines through yeah. their town. Yeah, and I'm so, sure uh, people are going to holler about <laughs> stuff that comes in from the north, too. I'm sure that's One true. One of your other interests, since you are on the Board of Education here in Nashua, right. is education. And right. And you wanted to say something about uh, the programs that are being implemented. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think as a lot of our viewers know, uh, the new uh, curriculum standards, the Common Core for math and English language arts, have been in implementation with, for the state since about July of 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, uh, the tests which put the teeth into the new standards uh, are going to be administered in, for the first time, for real, in spring of 2015. So it's this school year mm -hmm. that our children will be tested in grades three through eight and grades 11 using the Smarter Balanced Assessment, which is an online adaptive test that matches to the 85% of the curriculum that is common across all of the states in the Common Core State Standards. So uh, there's been a lot of pushback uh, in the community and amongst teachers against the Common Core Standards. And and Carl, you know, what huge changes even a year to a year and a half makes. In the end of March of last year, the first of the major nationwide uh, surveys was, was conducted. And 800 American Federation of Teachers, teachers uh, responded to a survey. And what we found from that survey was that 600, 75%, favored the idea of the Common Core but 74% felt that they weren't far enough along in their districts and in their classrooms to be ready for a test in two years' time. Well, uh, so a lot of Common Core proponents have, you know, essentially used that number. 75% of all teachers support the Common Core, but they forgot to mention that 74% don't believe we're going to be ready in well, spring they of 2015. supporting a concept, but not the actual details in the concept. Right. Now, here's what's happened since then. You know, for example, right here in Nashua, right. uh, in December of this last year, we had, uh, you know, entire schools during their professional development days. You know, when the kids are, are not there, uh, the teachers and the principals got together and they all took the practice smarter balanced assessment. And the results were just devastating. In fact, one uh, of our middle school principals actually wrote an open mm -hmm. letter mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of all of the teachers expressing the concern that that school had for the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And uh, the National Teachers Union subsequently backed that school up with the letter mm -hmm. of its own we have a, only about a minute left here. Uh, what do you think is going to happen here in Nashua? Is that going to slow down? or uh, I mean, everybody I, I, wants good standards. Right. They want to be able to be competitive. I, I think what's going to happen for sure is that unless something really drastic happens, we're, we're going to be administering that test in Nashua in the spring of 2015. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in that year, like late this summer, it turns out that in two nationwide surveys, uh, more than half of all teachers now oppose the Common Core curriculum standards themselves. The National Education Association, the largest teachers union, elected a president overwhelmingly that, that is totally against the Common Core and is urging teachers across the nation to basically go ahead and just say no. Uh, the American Federation of Teachers of New Hampshire, uh, an AFL-CIO affiliated teachers union, in this past March, I actually supported my bill and testified before the State House mm. on behalf of a bill that I prime sponsored to delay the Common Core assessments by two years. Now, does delay mean possibility of change out of Common Core? Yes. Okay. You know, for example, what we really should be doing is allowing, like Massachusetts does, we should be allowing school districts to choose either the current 
test for Massachusetts, it's the MCAS. For us, it would have been the kneecap or the common core tests. Choose one or the other and possibly transition to uh, the newer test over a two-year period. Uh, that option was not made available to New Hampshire. They basically just abruptly cut off the kneecap, and the only <laughs> choice that we have cut you off the knees. is the smarter balanced assessment. We got painted into a corner. I see. And the interesting thing is that of the 27 Nashua state representatives that we have, uh, of whom three are Republican and 24 are, are Democrat, uh, 13 of our legislators went on roll call to vote against the teachers and against a delay of these Common really? Core standards. So I think for those 13, it may be interesting uh, this coming November. I hope November. people know what, uh, what is being done. And uh, local control still is the best bet, I think. I, I agree with you. Okay. Well, David, we're out of time. Thank you very much for All your right, information Carl. and good luck in your uh, run for being reelected. And on both issues, the energy and the education, two very important things for our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seating program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.